Okay, so it's time for our second question show. We're gonna try to move towards getting these done on a regular basis, so keep your questions coming. Here we go. Bob Guzman wants to know, if the Big Bang happened, why doesn't the universe look like a sphere moving away from a center point? So the concept of the Big Bang, we imagine this explosion, right? Boom, but the reality is the explosion is the wrong concept to use, that it is an expansion. And the analogy that we always use is like the surface of a balloon, right? Imagine the surface of a balloon. It's a sphere with a bunch of dots all over it. Just imagine that, right? And then as the sphere expands, those dots all move away from each other. So that is a two-dimensional surface. Now, obviously, it's embedded in a three-dimensional space. You can say, well, the middle of the balloon is right in the very middle, and that's where the center of the balloon is. But don't think about the middle of the balloon. Think about the surface of the balloon and how there is no middle to the surface of the balloon. If you go in any direction around the balloon, you just return to your starting point. And so as you make it bigger, the distance to go all the way around the balloon gets longer, but it's not like there's a new center anywhere. Now you have to scale that up one more level. So now you're thinking about the universe. It is a three-dimensional thing that is expanding potentially within a four-dimensional space, whatever. But the point is, is that as the universe expands, all of the galaxies see all the other galaxies moving away from each other. We see all the galaxies moving away from us. They see all the galaxies moving away from each other. They see our galaxy moving away. And so there's not like some single point that's an explosion. It is this expansion that exists throughout the entire universe. Arsene Wegner wants to know, what would happen if a nuclear bomb detonated in space? So nuclear bombs work just fine in space. Uh, in fact, you know, they're a little better because they're not have, they don't have to deal with the atmosphere. They just can explode in this sort of spherical area. And so nukes are absolutely considered as weaponry. Uh, I don't know if any have actually been deployed, but they're, they're definitely in consideration. Uh, one of the really cool ideas is as a propulsion system called the Orion Project, you could use, you have a spacecraft that has this big plate on the back of it, it drops out nuclear bombs behind it, the bombs explode, and that accelerates the rocket because it get, gets pushed by the nuclear explosion and goes faster and faster. And then theoretically, you could reach a very high percentage of the speed of light using the system. Just drop, keep dropping bombs behind you and accelerate your spacecraft. Assuming it can handle the, you know, these explosions behind it. Shark Trail wants to know, can you see the Earth from Mars? So if you were on the surface of Mars, you can totally see the Earth. In fact, because the Earth is bigger and brighter than Mars, Earth in the Martian sky is brighter than Mars is in Earth's sky. And there's lots of pictures of Earth seen from the surface of Mars. Yeah, absolutely. The rovers can look up in the sky and they can see Earth. V.Y. Canis. How about what happens when the universe can't get any colder, yet is still expanding? What will a photon do when it can't lose any more energy? A photon can always lose more energy. Well, what, what happens is as the expansion is happening, the, the wavelengths of the photon, the wavelengths of the light, are stretching out as this expansion is happening. And so over time you can imagine, and this is what we see with the cosmic microwave background radiation, we're seeing what was once visible light or even, even higher wavelengths stretched out into microwaves. And so they'll just keep getting stretched out into radio waves and then longer and longer wavelength radio waves. So you can imagine some future where a single photon of light, its wavelength has been stretched to light years, to the width of our galaxy. Just, you know, way to Google years and whatever photons are out there will have been stretched to the point that they're completely undetectable, but they're still there. They just have this enormous wavelength. Darshan Naidu, question, how do you break in space? Let's say you're driving super fast and assuming you can render what's in front of you, how do you stop? Yeah, so how you break in space is, is a really hard problem because essentially, if you build up velocity to a certain point, you have to then shed that velocity to stop again. And so, you know, one of the ideas, if you wanna to go to say Alpha Centauri and you have some spacecraft capable of accelerating itself, to reach a velocity that can get there in a reasonable amount of time, the spacecraft then has to turn around and fire that engine for the exact same amount of time that it used to accelerate, but now it has to decelerate. So it's an enormous problem. Uh, you know, with some of these spacecraft that we're thinking of sending to other stars, like the Starshot, uh, they won't break. They'll just go right past at high speed. This is what happened with NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. It didn't break. It just went right past Pluto 
at super high speed, took a bunch of pictures and just kept going because slowing it back down again takes a ton of energy. Radioactive music for you. Could you do another Uranus video? I've got some more jokes I thought of. Yeah, well, my idea is to come up with a book of dirty Uranus jokes, and then we'll just like publish that. So keep them coming. Tony Ragged asks, if we did manage to build a Dyson Sphere for our use, what would happen to the other planets? If we built a Dyson Sphere here in the solar system, the only way that we could get that shell around the whole sun is if we tore every single planet up, all the gas giants, all the terrestrial planets, tore them all up and turned them into this Dyson Sphere. Now the problem is the Dyson Sphere isn't feasible because the shape is instable and so it would kind of collapse in on itself. But the idea of a Dyson Swarm where you've got these spacecraft that are all at the distance of the Earth and they're all sort of swarming around the sun, that's feasible. And once again, you're gonna to wanna to dismantle the entire solar system to have this group of Dyson Spheres. So those planets gotta go if we're gonna have that Dyson Sphere. El Galicki, how did you post this question two days ago if the video was uploaded seven hours ago? So the question is really, how is it that some users on the channel are able to post their questions or comments on our videos days before the video went public? And that's because they're patrons. Remember I say the patrons get to see the videos early? They're seeing the videos early, we're having a conversation about it, and then we release it open to the public a couple of days later, and that's when you get to join in on the conversation. If you want to comment early, patreon.com slash universe today. Kieran Metcalf, one picky little thing. I'm listening while working. Could you have someone read out the questions on future episodes? Uh, yeah, your feedback has been incorporated. I hope you're hearing my voice read out the questions before you're seeing me answer the question. Don't even look at the screen, just continue podcasting along as you always did. Jake Shock wants to know, if you could ask one question to a really advanced alien civilization, say a type three in Kardashev scale, what would it be? Well, I would want to know how they avoided the great filter. And this is the idea that, that we don't see a lot of alien civilizations out there because there's something that is somehow preventing people from exploring the universe. Now, assuming that, you know, the, it was a really simple answer and there's, you know, then I would want to know about methods of power generation. How can you, you know, what alien life is out there? I would love to access some of their cool books, watch their TV shows. I would love just the cultural knowledge, to be able to kind of download the cultural knowledge of these other civilizations. So that would be my, that, that's what I'd like to know. Victor Yi, what determines the direction of orbiting? What if you place two binary stars without any initial force or stuff? Will they stay firmly, start to orbit in a random direction, or pull each other together straightly? So if you had two binary stars and you just plop them in space, they would gravitationally attract to each other and collapse into a star, a bigger star. So uh, what happened was a long time ago, the stars formed out of the solar nebula and the solar nebula was rotating and the motions of those parts of the gas cloud collapsed into stars and they kept maintaining their position around each other. So uh, you need to have those those motions. It's like what happens in our solar system, right? We've got the sun at the middle and then the disk was orbiting around it and all of the planets formed in the middle of that of the disk and they maintained their positions because they already had all of this momentum, this angular momentum built up at their orbital velocity. So you need to have that same thing happen with binary stars to get them to not just crash into each other. So, uh, good. Well, thanks for everyone for asking all of their questions. I really appreciate it. And of course, if you want to ask questions in the future, just go on to YouTube and just type your question at the bottom of any video. I try to read all the questions. I try to answer them right there, but I also try to pluck a bunch of them out and answer them here. So keep them coming. So that user, oh, let me do another answer. Okay, sorry, it's okay, I got it.